Welcome again to Hidden Truths. Hope everybody's doing great. And today we have Bob Barrow and Bob's going to speak about the recession and the progress and everything that's happening. The topic of recession has been lingering for a while now, Bob, leaving everyone pondering of its eventual occurrence. And for some quite some time, you've been telling the audience that it's brewing. Last week, we got retail sales data and reports from companies like Home Depot and Target. How did these results play into the overall picture of the economy, Bob? Okay, so I have a chart here. It's called the Johnson Red Book Same Source Sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first thing to note is that same store sales have continued to decline now for quite some time. Retail sales, they came out last week. The seasonally adjusted number in April was plus 0.4%. And that, that was a month over month, so it was higher than March's by that amount. And the financial media thought this was fantastic. However, if you just get a little more sophisticated and look at the not seasonally adjusted data, you'll see that in April, not seasonally adjusted retail sales actually fell 2.4%. And this was the worst showing in, for any April in the last five years, if we exclude the pandemic. If we just look at it from year ago sales, the not seasonally adjusted sales were down 1%, that's $5.8 billion. So they were lower in April than they were in April of 22. Now think about this. Over that time period, inflation has risen 5%. Okay. So if the nominal sales were down 1% and inflation was up by 5%, in real terms, volumes are down 6%. That is very significant. And it does show you that despite the people on TV who keep on saying the economy is in good shape, it isn't. Now I have a table that shows some of the changes in some of the categories. For example, furniture was down 0.7% month over month and 6.4% on a year over year basis. And it's been negative in three months running and in four of the last five months. Electronics and appliances, they were down a half a percent, down 7.3% year over year, negative now three months in a row. Building materials were actually up a half a percent, but they're still down nearly 4% on a year over year basis. Sporting goods. So you think about the consumer. If the consumer has a lot of money, they buy stuff and likely sporting goods, golf clubs, that kind of stuff. Right? When they don't have money, they don't they use the old golf clubs. So sporting goods were down 3.3%. That's quite large for any one month. Yeah. and down 5.5% um, year over year, and are now down like the others three months in a row. So last week, we had uh, one of the bellwether companies for U.S. consumer spending, Home Depot, report. They had the worst revenue miss in more than 20 years. Wow. They yeah. missed expectations on their revenues by more than a billion dollars. The actual sales were 37.3 billion and the street expected 38.3 billion. And then the company guided its revenue outlook lower for the next quarter and the next year by three and a half percent and its earnings per share, they guided lower by 10%. That's huge. Okay. Big ticket items, they said, were particularly hit hard. They were off six and a half percent from your earlier levels. And we'll see this again when we talk about Target. And the company said its inventories remain bloated. The inventories were 13% higher than in the same quarter in 2022. So for the consumer, that's good news because bloated inventories mean things go on sale. Orders continued to decline at Cisco. That's one of the big tech producing industries. And that's for several quarters in a row that they've declined. Target, as I said earlier, missed its revenue expectation just 
Home Depot did. It said that sales slowed particularly in the discretionary categories in March and then firm further deteriorated in April. So we're on a downtrend at Target. A weakening consumer also shows through when you look at the big boost in credit card balances that occurred in, in the first quarter. $148 billion more in credit card balances. And that's kind of shocking given that interest rates on credit cards are 25% or more. And at the same time, as you can see in the charts I have here, we see a spike up in, in auto loan delinquencies and also in credit card delinquencies. And you'll note there's three lines in each of the charts. The dark dotted line are people in, the, in their 20s, and the dot dashed blue line are people in their 30s. So they have particularly been hard hit, and their delinquency rates are rising rapidly. And now, make matters worse, Bank of America says that beginning in September or maybe October, the student loan payments will have to restart. That's $200 to $400 a month for 30 million borrowers. Yeah. So just let's look at this. There are currently 43 million Americans who owe the federal government $1.6 billion in student loans. Of the 43 million, 30 million are on the payment plan because they've graduated. And 13 million are still active students, so they don't have to pay yet. The Supreme Court is currently considering President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan, uh, and that forgiveness plan would forgive a percentage of the loans outstanding. And we won't know their decision for some time, but the line of questioning by the conservative justices does not bode well for a decision in favor. So it looks like, at least from the line of questioning, that loan forgiveness will not go through. Yeah, I mean, that obviously is going to change the life of a lot of people, millions right. of people. That's dramatic. Oh. 200 to $400 a month, they yeah. can't consume. Um, are there any other signs of economic stress in the consumer sector, Bob? Oh, well, let's look at gasoline sales. They were down 0.8% in April and have now been down six months in a row. Okay, if we look at the CPI and we look at the gasoline component of the CPI, we will see that it is lower by 12% from a year earlier, okay? So that's good news. Nominal sales, however, in gasoline are down 15%. So putting the numbers together in volume terms, we see that in, in, we have a 3% decline in gasoline usage. Now, since the automobile is such a central part of American life, when it's driven less, it's a sure sign of recession. And we can say similar things are happening in the food at home category. Grocery sales were down 0.2% in April and on top of a 0.3% fall in March. And these sales have now been negative in four of the last five months. Let's do the same analysis that we did with the autos. Look at the CPI. The food at home prices were up. 1.7% in, in the December to April period, so over that five months. Sure. At the same time, sales at grocery stores fell 2.3%. So if we take and put the two together again, we see a negative 4% in real terms. Now, clearly, the typical American family is trading down. It's buying store and generic brands instead of the advertised higher price items, but they're, they're buying less. We had something we called the reopening trade. Well, what does that mean? People were locked up in their houses for several months. And when they finally got the all clear to go out again, we call it the reopening trade. And what did they do? They, they flew to places that they and they went to restaurants in particular, okay? Let's look at the restaurants. So the reopening trade we know occurred, restaurant sales grew. In, in January to April, said the sales trend is down 5.4% for restaurants. 
So clearly, the reopening upsurge is now in the rearview mirror. Finally, clothing. That's a really good, good sign of where the economy is, and especially when the female population has the credit card. If clothing fa sales fall, it's a bad sign. And they were off 2.3% in April, and they were off 2% before that in March. Uh, that's a really good sign of, of where, the, yeah. where yeah. the consumer is. Besides the consumer, do you see stress in the other parts of the economy? Yes, of course. The banking crisis isn't making headlines, but it's still there. What's being ignored is that rapidly rising interest rates not only cause losses in the bank's bond portfolio, which is easy to measure because you can look at market prices, but it is having a significant impact on their loan portfolios. Okay, those are harder to measure, but when interest rates go up, if they have a a loan that's yielding 3% and we're in a 5% market or a 6% market, that loan isn't worth par anymore. It's worth less than par. Most regional and community banks have significant holdings of commercial real estate in their loan portfolios. And the chart that I have here shows what is happening in general to commercial property prices. You can see that they peaked in 2022 and have begun to fall. And they're only going to fall from here as the recession unfolds. And we're going to see rising loan losses at the banks. Already, all those banks have already tightened their lending standards. So it's going to be much harder for businesses to get any cash when they need it. In the manufacturing sector, too, signs are pointing to recession. I have a chart here that shows what is called the ISM. That's the Institute for Supply Management. They're manufacturing PMI, which stands for Purchasing Managers Index. It has been below 50 for seven straight months. 50 is the demarcation line between expansion and contraction. So it's been in contraction for seven months. In addition, if we look at hours worked, the work week and overtime hours, they all point to a significant slowdown in the manufacturing sector. Another reason that we believe that deflation is our future comes from the surveys of supplier delivery times. These are how fast suppliers can deliver what you order. So during the pandemic, it, it was a long time because there was so much demand for goods. And now, if you look at this chart, you'll see that supplier delivery times are lower than at any point on this chart. Um, yes. And this chart goes back to 08, so it's even lower than it was in 08. Um, and notice that's the blue line. The black line is, is inflation in, in, in goods. And you can see how closely that black line follows the blue line. There's a five-month lag in, in this chart. So in five months, we can expect that goods inflation will be Negative, probably negative two, three, or four percent. Right. The conclusion is obvious. A weakening consumer, strains in the banking system, those imply recession. Uh, and the call we made several months ago about inflation in, turning into deflation by 2024, that's now being talked about by other economists, some of whom have very recognizable names. So Fed Chair Powell has compared himself to Paul Faulkner, the Fed chairman in the 1980s, that raised interest rates to 20% and eventually killed off inflation. Yeah. Volcker was the chairman of the Fed from August of 79 to August of 87, and he is credited with, shall I quote, slaying the great inflation dragon of the 1970s and 80s. Okay, how did he do it? Like today, he did it by raising interest rates to the point of causing a recession. But here is a point of differentiation between the Volcker Fed and today's Fed. In July 1982, like today, when the recession was just starting, Volcker, seeing signs that the economy was weakening, just like we see today, he was wise enough to start a process 
of lowering interest rates. And he did that even though inflation was still double digits. Over the next five years, while there were some short periods of small rate increases, rates were in a steep declining trend, and so was inflation. So I have a chart here that shows the annual percentage change in the CPI. On the left side, you'll see it for the 1970s and 1980s. And on the right-hand side, you'll see it for 2020 through April. Okay? So I want you to look at the right-hand side of the chart on the right, and you can see the steep fall in today's rate of inflation. And look how similar it appears to the steep fall in the rate of inflation in 1980 and 81. Okay. Remember, I just described that Volcker began to lower interest rates just as the recession started. So that would be in 1981. But despite those lower rates, back in 81, inflation continued to fall. Based on that pattern and the pattern that we see here emerging in 2023, we forecast that today's inflation rate will continue to fall over the next few quarters. Most economists now agree that a recession has either already begun or will do so shortly. Will this Fed be as wise as the 1982 Volcker Fed and begin to lower rates as the recession opens? If we go by their current swagger and the current rhetoric, the answer is no, they won't lower. In fact, there appears to be several hawkish FOMC members, that's the rate-making body of the Fed, who still believe that rates should go higher. Two such members, one is Lori Logan of the Dallas Fed, and the other is Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, both recently spoke and voiced their support for another rate hike at the June Fed meeting. That's June 14th. The billion-dollar question, is this just rhetoric to keep financial markets from stampeding to lower rates? Or do they actually believe that rates need to go higher. Recently, last week, market odds of a June rate hike were 10%. Since those two spoke, they're now over 48%. So 48% of the economists believe that the Fed is going to hike again in June. Right. Once again, I'll conclude, inflation is falling and is likely to turn to deflation in 2024. They don't have to do anything else. Nearly all economists now see a recession coming. In the 80s, when that recession was starting, Fed Chair Volcker lowered rates. This Fed doesn't appear to be so inclined. And while it's hard to believe from looking at the evidence and looking at the data, they're talking about raising interest rates again. So one, one more thing that, that the audience should think about. We all know that it takes quite some time, several months, maybe even a year, from the time that the Fed acts to it actually to have an impact on the economy. So if we look back one year, they were at 1%. So that means the other 4% that they raised still hasn't had an impact. Most economists would say, you've done enough, wait and see what happens. I don't know where they get their data from, but these this set of FOMC folks just seems to want to uh, overkill it. Thank you so much, Bob. Appreciate it very much. For everyone else, hope you enjoyed this topic with Bob. Remember to subscribe to the channel and share with your network and we will see you next time. Uh -huh.